Good evening, everybody. Sorry about the slight delay there. It's uh, it's Christmas. But uh, my name is John Ball, Professor of Forestry at South Coast State University. And tonight I'm going to be hosting uh, Garden Hour. As hopefully everybody's aware, we've been doing the show every week during the growing season. And then during the off season, uh, we've kind of moved to a, a every other month. Our next show will be Valentine's Day. So I don't know, we'll do something festive that evening. Uh, but as usual, we have four panelists, and so I'll start with the introductions, and I'll say who I am again and what I'm going to do, and then we'll have each of our presenters tonight chat a little about themselves, and then we'll get into it. So again, John Ball, I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist here at South Dakota State University. I'm also the Forest Health Specialist for the South Dakota Department of Ag. And tonight, as you can probably see, I'm going to be talking about Christmas trees and a little bit about firewood. And then after that, we're going to go to Christina. So, Christine, what are we chatting about tonight? Well, um, we can't really talk about any outdoor um, herbaceous plants anymore. So I'm going to be talking about some indoor plants. And it's pretty safe to assume you're going to see at least one poinsettia photo tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you. And then, Claudia, what are we chatting about this evening? Um, well, hi, I'm Claudia. I'm a nutrition field specialist for SDSU Extension, and I'm going to be talking about home food preservation and some crafts and some like appetizers and snacks you can use some pre preserved foods with. Sounds great. And then Prairie, what are we finishing up with tonight? Good evening, everyone. I'm Prairie Walkling, family and community health field specialist based in Rapid City and I'm filling in for Amy Ladonsky, our state master gardener coordinator, and we're going to talk about the training that's coming up in 2023. All right. Well, it sounds great. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, a lot of our viewers, of course, are master gardeners, and uh, I know they're anxious to hear what may be going on this year. And I know uh, Christine and myself are always, uh, always look forward to having a master gardener class, either online or, or in person. Well, I'll get it kicked off. And again, as everybody knows, we do have that uh, chat box and question and answer. We'll check that as we're speaking here tonight. And then we'll take some general questions towards the end, our usual format. But I'm going to go over a little bit about Christmas trees. By the way, this is the 2022 capital Christmas tree that I always get the... Uh, the honor or pleasure, I guess, of uh, harvesting. This one was an easy one. It was right in pier. And it was one of those trees that got a little too big for its spot. So it did have to come down. And what better use for a tree than at least standing up in the Capitol for about a month as our state's Christmas tree. So it was a real fun one. And something I enjoy doing every year. There was a 2017 one. It's always interesting how they get these darn things into the building. But, you know, let's go over a little bit about Christmas trees. Now, by the way, we've gone back to artificial. Uh, it seems like we had a little blip during COVID where people are going traditional, but we've gone back. And, you know, artificial, well, it's made of plastic. It's not renewable. Uh, transported from overseas, they're coming from China, and then after they're used, which surprisingly is less than six years in some cases, they end up in a landfill and they stay there forever. Now, real Christmas trees, again, uh, the disposal is an issue there. Don't burn them. Turn them into a mulch. That's the best way to maintain that carbon. They do take about seven or eight years of care, and obviously they got to be cut and transported every year. But, you know, if you're looking at where's the carbon balance, it's about six to 10 years. If you're one of these people that buy an artificial tree and you keep it for 20 years, that was a smart thing to do. If you're one of these folks that says, no, I get rid of an artificial tree every three years, no, you'd be better with uh, a real Christmas tree. And obviously in my household, we have one of each. So we're kind of splitting the difference. Uh, by the way, the drought has increased prices and availability. As you're watching this tonight, a lot of Christmas tree growers are gonna be starting to shut down for the season, believe it or not. This next weekend may be their final one. Reason why they cut in their inventory during COVID. And then with the drought, the trees are growing slower, so availability is not as good. I've talked to a number of growers in uh, Sioux Falls, excuse me, in South Dakota and in adjacent Minnesota, 
that are saying, yeah, this weekend will be their last, where normally they're open all the way up to Christmas. So if you don't have your tree, get it soon. And if you're going to still get that tree, how do you avoid that Charlie Brown Christmas tree, the one nobody really wants? Well, the freshest tree you can get is one you cut yourself. And that's why I recommend you use the choose and cuts that may be in your area. Now, most of those are going to be in the eastern part of the state. And then, of course, the Black Hills, you can get a permit and, and harvest a tree from the Black Hills National Forest. Both good sources. But a lot of us are going to go to Christmas tree lots. Now, those trees have been cut probably since late October, early November. So they've been around for a little bit. So how do you get a fresh one? Well, run your fingers through the needles. They shouldn't start coming off yet. And if you shake the tree a little bit, you don't want to see a lot of needles falling on the ground already. So give it a little shake and pull a couple of needles, just a little tug and see if they remain. If they start coming off, bypass that tree. And then if you did buy a fresh tree, when you get it home, recut the base. Place it in the stand that'll hold at least a gallon of water. They'll take up that much the first night. And then check that water daily and add as needed. Once that dries out, it'll never take water up again. So check it daily. And then obviously keep away from heat sources. Don't put it in a bright window. Don't put it over a heat vent. And watch your light sources as well. Those LED lights are uh, very popular nowadays. But, you know, if you're still looking to put it up, clean out that stand from last year. A uh, little one to 10 bleach water solution to clean it up and make sure you have a stand big enough that'll hold a gallon of water. And when you put the tree into it, put a gallon of water in immediately. Now, recutting the base is kind of important to reopen those pores so they'll absorb water again. And you just have to go up about an inch. The angle doesn't matter. Just make sure you cut it cleanly. And then the second you cut it, put it in the stand. Now, the bad thing is if, if you look one day and the water's gone out of the stand, well, the only way it's going to take up water again is pick the whole thing up and recut the base, and nobody's going to do that. So from then on, you're going to end up with a tree with a pretty short shelf life. Oh, by the way, the only thing you need in that stand is water. Uh, floral preservatives, commercial tree preservatives, molasses, sugar, bleach, 7-Up was popular a number of years ago. Aspirin, for some reason, I have no idea. Honey, and I mean, there's all sorts of concoctions people come up with. Uh, to put it, I've, Vodka, for example. Uh, don't. You don't want the dog lapping it up. And, and really, the only thing the tree needs is water. You don't need to try to replace sugars in that tree or add acid to keep the pores open in that. Uh, water's it, but never let it dry out. And then what do you want on a Christmas tree? You want it to smell nice. You want it with branches stiff enough that the, that the ornaments don't fall off, and you want it to have good needle retention. Nobody likes walking across the carpet in their socks and picking up needles during Christmas. So here's the list, checking it twice. Scott's Pine is probably the classic that's been around forever. When I lived in Michigan, grew tons of these. Uh, 36 million across the whole state were growing. Uh, and reason why, excellent stiffness. You can hang heavy ornaments and excellent needle retention. Fragrance is pretty good. Uh, a couple of others on this list I wanna point out. You can get white spruce, those you can buy. Uh, at some of the choose and cuts, or you can cut out of the Black Hills National Forest. I want you to note on that, the fragrance can be poor, almost musty sometimes, and only fair needle retention. That's a tree that I like putting up maybe two weeks before Christmas. And then blue spruce, nah. Uh, maybe good needle retention. I'd put it up about a week from now, and then it'll last through Christmas. By the way, one positive to putting a blue spruce up as if you have cats in the house. Cats won't climb the blue spruce, or at least most won't. Someone's going to send me a picture of their cat up in their blue spruce, but it's kind of like climbing a porcupine, so they tend to avoid it. But the bottom two are really our favorites, and they're sold throughout the state. Balsam fir and Fraser fir. Fraser fir is the absolute best. Now, for stiffness, no. But for needle retention, it's a tree you can put up at Thanksgiving and take down at Easter. 
Uh, so if you're one of these people that really likes to extend the season into January, this is your treat and an excellent fragrance. Oh, by the way, I will start getting uh, pictures and that of people saying, my tree's alive. No, it's not. It's a zombie tree. It's the living dead. Uh, after Christmas, it's not going to root in that water. But you know what? Sometimes with a little warmth and a little water, you'll start getting some of the cones starting to pop, the male cones. And that doesn't mean the tree's coming back to life. It just means your house is warm and the tree's got water in it. And for those that say, you know what, they want a tree that they can plant back out in your yard, uh, you can buy these living, real Christmas trees. Problems with those is, unless you've already dug the hole before it froze, what are you going to do with that tree after Christmas? Because it can sit in the house for a little bit. If you just set it outside, those roots can't be exposed to temperatures lower than 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Otherwise, you're going to kill roots. So you better have a place already set aside for it. Now, the top has to be uh, having freezing temperatures. So you can't just say, well, I'll put it in the basement. But if you can put it in a garage where it's going to get the ambient air temperature, but cover the base so it can freeze, but it's not going to get lower than 20 degrees. And then you can plant it out in the spring and have a pretty good chance of survival. But most of the time, people just set the plant out. Unless you get good snow cover, you'll kill the roots. And come spring after you plant it, it'll brown completely out. Well, the other thing I want to touch upon just for a second before we move to Christine is a lot of firewood sales this year, more than most. And if you're buying a cord of firewood, the prices seem to be about $300 a cord. Now, a cord has a dimension. It's eight feet long, four feet high, and four feet wide, 128 cubic feet. A cord means a cord. You can't make up your own dimensions. Face cords can mean a lot of things. Heaping pickup loads can mean a lot of things. But if you buy a cord of firewood, it should fit in 128 cubic feet. So again, that's eight feet long, four feet high, and four feet wide. Uh, watch that. Now, I've seen a lot of places where some people say, well, I'm getting it for $100. I said, how are you buying it? Well, they've got a pickup load. Well, that's not a cord. That's often about a third of a cord. So your price is okay, but it's not a bargain. And you want to make sure you're getting seasoned firewood, firewood that's been set and, and split and dried for at least six months to get that moisture content below 28%. So it doesn't steam in your fireplace. It actually crackles. Uh, best fuel woods, the ones that have the highest BTUs, British thermal units, Apple, honey, locust, and oak. A lot of people don't know honey locust is an excellent wood. If you can get that as a firewood, it's worth it. This will, all these woods, apple is fragrant, oak is great, but they will coal for a long, long time. They're the best woods to use. The worst at 13 to 1500, basswood, box elder, cottonwood, and poplar. In fact, cottonwood and poplar are known as gopher woods because you're always going for more. Uh, they go to ash very quickly, so you can burn them, but most of your heat's going to be from you getting up, running, and grabbing more firewood than sitting before a uh, open fire. Uh, a couple of reminders, though. Don't stack firewood right next to the house like this. Uh, uh, you can get a lot of things in firewood. You don't want them getting into your house, and uh, don't put them up next to trees like I see out in the Black Hills because when people are stacking it this way, if it's fresh firewood this summer, it'll attract boars. And sure enough, this one right here was just covered with turpentine beetles. Don't use standing pine trees as posts to hold up your freshly cut pine wood. It's a good way to call in all the bark beetles. And then finally, a reminder for any of our listeners in Lincoln, Minnehaha, and Turner County, uh, you cannot mew firewood of any species out of those counties at any time of the year. Reason for that is our concern is someone's going to have ash firewood. They don't know it's ash. It's hard to, hard to identify for most people. And they move it out to their cabin somewhere, and we've now moved emerald ash borer. And emerald ash borer right now is curled up in the sapwood of the tree. I like curled up like a cat sitting down for its long winter nap. And it's very well protected from the cold. 
but it's going to remain there until next June, first of June, and then it will emerge. Now, to show you the concern, see that little piece of wood, 15 inches long, three inches in diameter? I, I cut pieces during the winter that we utilize for research. This one piece, I had five adults come out of it, five adults. Now imagine someone carrying that small of a piece of wood out of Lincoln or Minneapolis County where we know the trees are infested and they move it to one of the surrounding counties or out to the Black Hills. We can very easily move an infestation. So use a little caution with that, but uh, firewood is, is great. There's a lot of sellers in South Dakota converting old windbreaks and that and another purpose, repurposing that wood, so to speak. So with that, I've tied up my time and now we're gonna move to some herbaceous plants. And as you mentioned, we'll probably hear a little bit about poinsettia. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and turn it over to you, Christine. All right. And just a reminder for everybody, if you have questions about any of our presentations while you know any of us are talking, feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A and we will always take a, take a look during our transitional time as well. So yes, as promised, you were going to see poinsettia photos, although you don't have to walk, um, walk very far in a store or a grocery store or um, your local church or event center without seeing poinsettias. Tis the season. So this plant is one that does take a little bit of work from the front end. So the photo on the right is actually one of poinsettias that I got the pleasure of growing while I was in college. And these poinsettias, um, a lot of people don't realize, but the work with poinsettias really begins in about July. Um, poinsettias are typically propagated by cuttings, which means they are taking um, vegetative material and the shoots of those plants and they are chopping those off with several little nodes. You're getting a bunch of little plants chopped apart, um, typically in late June, early July, um, which is a really, you know, the time that you want to be a greenhouse employee in nice, hot, humid conditions. And then they are sticking those in a propagation media and um, typically shipping those out. And we call that liners. And when those plants get to the greenhouse, they're then being stuck in all sorts of different pots. And there's fertilizer regimens. There's a lot of monitoring of growth to maintain plant height for poinsettias. And we also use a process called pinching, which isn't totally unlike deadheading. So if you're used to, you know, trimming back your plants to get them to branch out in the summer, your bedding plants, we use a very similar process for poinsettias. And that's done when they're quite young and you uh, are pinching those plants at several nodes. Um, you know, a node would be like right here. And what that's doing is encouraging branching. And we want lots of branching so that we can get bract coloration. Now, a lot of people think, oh, that white and that red and that pink, oh, that's poinsettias have such beautiful flowers. If you don't already know, I'm here to disappoint, but flowers of the poinsettia are actually these itty bitty little yellow guys right here in the middle. That's the flower. Now, when flowers start to form and start to open, it triggers those surrounding leaves. They're a specialized leaves called a bract. Um, the chlorophyll in those, um, in those bracts starts to break down and reveal the pigments that are beneath that or um, located below that. And that's where you get that color formation. So when um, folks are working to breed poinsettias, really don't care at all about the flower color. That's just that little yellow guy right there in the middle. Um, it's really the bract coloration that all of the breeding and color development has been for. And you can see some really fun speckled spotted, you know, reds and whites. And I'm kind of partial to these creamy, creamy speckled patterns. Now the poinsettia is with glitter. I hate to break it to you, but that is spray paint. We haven't gotten to the point in plant breeding yet where we have metallic, um, cell structure in our poinsettia plants, but you'll see fun things like orange. Sometimes you'll see those released um, for Thanksgiving. And the reason we get that bract formation or that coloration of those bracts is poinsettias need short days and long nights. So this is done in a commercial setting or if you, know, you were undergraduate Christine in college, it's done through shading. 
And so you are trying to um, exclude, not trying to, you have to um, for successful BRAC formation. For eight to 10 weeks, you are excluding light um, to have 14 to 16 hour nights. And if you, you know, let's say you didn't shade your plants and the street light came on or the headlight of the cars drove by, that can be enough to, um, it's called night interruption lighting, to um, slow the, the process of brack coloration and poinsettias which is one of the reasons if you're keeping poinsettias in your home that it can be sometimes really frustrating to get those poinsettias to rebloom the next year. So some of the ways you might do that if you are hanging on to your poinsettia for next year is putting that plant in the closet every night or having a tote that you put over it, something to keep lamp light and any, any light in your living room or kitchen from touching that plant. So if you're out in, at the store and you're wondering what poinsettia to pick, um, definitely look for a nice, nice, healthy plant. If you see one that's really droopy, obviously you're probably not gonna buy that. If it's in your home and you're starting to notice that your poinsettia is looking really droopy, um, it's not uncommon for people to overlove their poinsettias and think, oh my goodness, it's dried out, I need to water it more. And one big culprit with poinsettias are these beautiful foil liners that we love to put on them. Um, folks will water and then they'll water again. And then, oh no, my plant's starting to look droopy and it must be dry and they'll water again. And what you don't realize is that you have now created a lake inside that beautiful foil. Um, you've excluded all oxygen from those roots and you might have the start of something such as pythium root rot. So um, the best thing you can do with watering your poinsettias, they don't need a lot of water um, and keeping them away from, you know, like the heater vents and things where you're going to have a lot of hot, dry air blowing on them will also keep them from drying out. Um, but you do not need to water poinsettias every day. By golly, you probably don't even need to water poinsettias every three days. Check that soil if it's completely dried down, bring that plant over to the sink, water it thoroughly, let it drain before you put it back into that decorative foil. Or if you're not married to the decorative foil, take it off and put that pot in, in a liner on a table so that it can drain and be elevated out of that water. Um, and we've got lots of um, SDSU extension articles with more poinsettia care tips. Um, and again, there are definitely options to hang on to it after the holidays, trim it back, keep it healthy throughout the season, and then experiment with um, shortening those days and extending those nights to get it to bloom again next year. Another fun holiday plant that people um, might be starting to notice, and this can be a really fun fun one to, re, um, to give to people as well, especially if folks aren't into poinsettias, and that is the amaryllis. And this is a bulb plant, so you have that compressed stem. You'll see this sold a couple of different ways. Sometimes in the garden centers or stores, you'll actually see them packaged where you can just purchase the bulbs. Look for the nicest, um, largest, healthiest bulbs. That means there's gonna be more stored energy, which could result in um, more blooms per bulb. One interesting thing about amaryllis is you wanna look for a pot that's fairly similar in size to the bulb. This is a plant where, you know, we often talk about the pitfalls of being pot bound. This is one that actually does really well being fairly pot bound. So you're not, you know, replanting the bulb every single year. Um, as that amaryllis, um, so if you're buying those bulbs and potting them, you're looking at between six to eight weeks from the time of planting it in a pot if you take it home keeping it well watered, but again, not over watering. We don't need that bulb to rot before it has any chance to sprout. And you'll start to see those shoots emerge and then you'll see that flower emerge. So um, keeping that amaryllis in nice bright light, 70 to 75 degrees, so a nice warm home or you know a bright sunny window, great option. Once that plant starts to bloom, if you wanna prolong bloom life, kind of similar to what we do with a lot of our cut flowers, Pull that plant um, away from that direct sunlight. It can be, you know, move it further back from the window. It could be in a little bit cooler location. And those blooms, some of them will hold for two to three weeks. And as one bloom starts to drop off, others will follow. Um, if you're someone who wants to 
keep this amaryllis and you know grow it out again and see if you can get it to rebloom. Um, it's really important. Don't. It's it's very similar to tulips. If those stalks and leaves are still green, leave them on the plant. They're still photosynthesizing. They're still packing, you know, nutrients and food that's being stored in that bulb for the next flush of blooms after a dormancy period. So um, avoid the temptation to just top everything off. Um, do, do hang on to that foliage because just like tulips and other bulbs, um, it's storing energy down below. All right. In general winter house plant considerations. So these are two photos I just snapped from my office this evening. And I've been doing a little bit of rearranging in my office. So one thing to think about with your house plants is how are they doing? And what is going on with the angle of the sun in your windows? So I have a window that faces west. And now that that sun is lower in the sky and you know angling from the south, I had to move some of my plants around so that they were catching more sunlight. Um, I'm someone who doesn't love turning on the artificial lights in my office if I don't have to. So I want my plants to get as much sun exposure as possible. Um, here, if you're someone who's really into houseplants that need bright direct light all the time, you may consider getting some LEDs or hanging some fluorescent bulbs. Um, sometimes when I walk home, I see some awesome house plant setups. I haven't invested in any artificial lighting, so it means I need to move some things around. The other thing you should be considering this time of year, um, I am a repeat offender, if you will. Think about drafty windows. If you have a lot of house plants on your windows, and by golly, do not put your poinsettia on a drafty window. It does not like to be cold. It's a tropical plant by nature. It will not be happy. Um, so here are some examples of plants that I have on my window in my office. I have had to pull some of them back and you'll notice I've got a quirky little cup dome on some of my plants. I recently took some cuttings from a plant that was not doing so well and that is my little pseudo humidity dome. So stay tuned, maybe in February or April, I'll, I'll have an update on how that one's doing, but um, pay attention to grass. And the other thing with your houseplants, um, a lot of our houseplants come from tropical environments that are used to high humidity. So pull those plants away from those blast and hot um, heater vents, um, trying to keep them uh, more humid is helpful. Grouping plants together um, can, can help with humidity. So you have a little bit of respiration and humidity um, shared with your house plants. Um, I'm someone at home. I run a humidifier. That helps me. It helps my plants. The pets are happy because there's no static electricity when I pet them. Um, so that's one of the best ways to increase humidity is using a humidifier grouping plants. Some people will do the pebble bases and some water underneath their plants that can help. Running around misting your plants with a spray bottle, not super helpful. Um, Overwatering your plants to increase humidity, also not helpful. That's just going to lead to root rot and yellowing of plants and um, not be the best case scenario. And the other thing is just keeping an eye out for, for pests, especially if you're introducing some new plants. Um, a culprit that can come in on poinsettias, for example, is white flies. So if you're out there shopping for a poinsettia and you notice any sticky substances on those leaves and it just feels like someone rubbed honey all over the leaves, you might be dealing with aphids, but it's with poinsettias, it's probably white flies. And you don't wanna bring that home to the rest of your house plants. So um, consider what plants you're bringing home for the holidays. And this has nothing to do with horticulture, or very little. Um, this is an artificial tree. Um, I'll defer to John on how we would make that make that work with a, a real tree. But just a festive throwback to when we were in college, we enjoyed hanging those artificial trees upside down and doing kind of a Christmas tree chandelier. And Claudia, close your ears for a minute. because This is not a good nutrition nutritional thing to share, but just an idea if you're looking for a gift for someone who likes a sweet treat, um, do consider the candy bouquet, um, a fun craft when consumed in moderation and paired with a nutritious recipe like what Claudia is gonna share. Um, and last but not least, I just wanna highlight a few events to wrap up this year and take us into 2023. Garden Glow at McCrory Gardens is set up. They've been getting a lot of promotion and I've been told that it's 
bigger and better than ever. And selfishly, I'm waiting for it to snow because I think holiday lights in the gardens look extra magical with snow. So the first major snowfall we get in Brookings, tell you what, I'm going to be at Garden Glow that night. And for information and how to get your tickets, um, you do, this is a ticketed event. So make sure you go to the McCrory Gardens website and um, reserve those tickets before you head out to Garden Glow. And as we think about 2023 and to look forward to the next season, if you have any interest in cut flower production and if I have any aspiring or beginning farmers in the group tonight, um, we are gonna be doing a webinar on growing and cut flower farms. We're gonna have two presenters from um, Over the Moon Farm in Eastern Iowa. And they have been cut flower farming for about five to six years and are gonna share, um, share tips and tricks for beginners and kind of share their farm marketing journey as well. And um, our colleagues in the nutrition program, so Anna Barr is leading a program called Bringing the Farm to School. And this is really gonna be designed to help farmers understand what in the world does it mean to sell to a school and how do you navigate contracts and how do you plan production? So if there are any producers in the audience tonight, or if you know someone, please share this with them. These are going to be in-person trainings, and we're going to have both an East River and a West River location. And by golly, last but not least, but only because I won't get a chance to tell you about it before I see you again in February, if you have any curiosity about what the SDSU Native Plant Initiative has been up to, their graduate students are gonna be sharing research updates covering topics from pollinators, soil health, and um, seed handling and propagation. That's gonna be a two-part series on Wednesday, February 1st and February 8th. And we would love to have you in the audience and I just need to get that registration page up and rolling. So keep an eye on our website for that one. And um, as always, you know that you can contact us in the off season. So um, if you come up with houseplant questions or poinsettia questions or any garden related questions as you're looking ahead to next year, just know that you can still reach out to the uh, SDSU Extension Garden Hotline and we are all happy to help. All right, we've got a quiet audience tonight. We must just be covering all the bases, so. Um, Claudia, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I apologize for showing all that chocolate. I know you're going to show more fruit to offset all of my bad habits. <laughs> okay, hi, sorry. Um, no, I am a big chocolate guru. I love candy, so I think all foods fit, so I am down for all foods. Okay, but today I'm going to talk to you guys about some food preservation crafts and then how to enjoy some of your preserved foods and then kind of about our program. Okay, so first we have dried citrus, which this has um, become a fairly popular um, craft lately. Um, at the bottom left, we have like citrus garland. So all you do is dry your like blood oranges, your regular oranges or grapefruits, kind of more usually in the red, red category. Um, you dry them, put them on some string. You can add some herbs or some special pine tree. I forgot the special Christmas trees, but extra cuttings, add those to your garland. Um, this one looks like it's hung up on a house, but I know a lot of people have been hanging them up on fireplaces or like on their mantles and stuff. That looks very cool. And you also could wrap it around your tree or really use it anywhere, but it's a very nice looking decoration. And then above that, there's a wreath. Um, just like you can add whatever you want to it. I think that has pine cones. I even think it has some peanuts in it, which that would be kind of an interesting choice, but it works. Um, and then to the right, that I really like. I think there's dried citrus. I believe it's baby's breath and lavender that's been dried as well. And then some eucalyptus and some just general leaves, I think. But again, they bundled them up and used them as a present topper. So I think that's very neat because not only are they getting that very soft looking blanket, but they're also getting some addition to home, home decor or they can pack that onto another present they're giving. So it looks like they did all the work, but. So that is a very cool um, decoration I've been seeing. 
So just to quick kind of highlight how we dry citrus fruits. Um, first off, you want to try and cut them as thin as you can. Um, because citrus can be kind of hard. They usually just recommend doing the peels. But in this case, we're doing the full slice. But since there's all the little pulp pieces, and then there's just like the coating around the pulp, if the slices are too thick, it can kind of get like nearly impossible to get them dry enough so they are preserved well. Um, so you always want to try and cut them very thin. Um, and then you also want to do a pre-treatment on them, which here my examples are ascorbic acid and a sulfite dip. Um, there's a lot more, which I can share. If you guys need any of my information, let me know and I can share it with you. But um, Clemson has an article which has a bunch of different pre-treatments. But basically what they do is um, help the fruit from turning brown. And they can preserve the flavor a little bit too, but the main point of them is to help them not turn brown, which is very important when you're using them for a decoration and stuff, because you don't want to be hanging them up above your fireplace. And then all of a sudden you have like brown, gross looking citrus slices. So, and all I do with that is mix the solution up as directed, let your um, slices sit in that mixture and then pull them out, drain them with water and pat them dry. And then you are gonna lay them in single layers, either in a dehydrator or an oven. Um, the recommendations say four to 12 hours, but definitely I, I would say eight to 12. Um, the picture on the right, those are my limes and lemons I um, preserved. And I had them in for about six hours, they were not dry. So, but I was too excited because it was the first time doing that. And I thought, oh, they look so cute. And I was just going to put them in like lemonade and stuff. So I was like, I still want them to be kind of moist so they can get some flavor, but they turn brown very quick because they weren't dry. So just be patient when you are dehydrating foods. Um, and when they are done, you want to see like no visible moisture. And then they also shouldn't be sticky or tacky. And then next we have the treats. Um, so two of these are like staples with my family. And then um, the other two are just other staples I know a lot of people have. So first we have candied jalapenos, which these are like my all time favorite. Um, I grew up on a dairy goat farm. So we always have goat cheese. So that's like our favorite thing is we put our candied jalapenos on top of the goat cheese and eat it with crackers or little toasted pieces of bread. And it is so good because you have the sweet and spicy and creamy. It's just so good. Um, you can also just put those on basically anything. You can put them on cream cheese or other creamy cheeses, nachos, hot dogs, burgers, macaroni and cheese. Like you can use them on a lot of stuff. Um, next, we have pickled beets. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I'd get home from school and I'd go straight to the fridge to start munching on the pickled beets. I love them. Um, we always have them at every holiday, not just in this time of the season, but at Easter, even 4th of July, we love pickled beets. Um, they work really well for like decoration as well. So if you're having a charcuterie board or something, they add a really awesome pop of color. Or even if you just have a tray of like pickles and olives, adding pickled beets will just give it another eye popping color. Next, we have apple butter. Um, this is a very universal spread. You can spread it on bread, crescent rolls, muffins, just a lot of stuff. And you can also mix it into stuff. So mix it into your cake batter, mix it into your cinnamon rolls, um, or even mix it into frosting. So you can use it for a lot of different things. And the next is the beloved cranberry sauce. Um, it's not only for Thanksgiving. Um, you can use it for other holidays too. Um, here in the photo, we have it on brie, and I think that is a very good combination because you get the sweetness and kind of tartness from the cranberries, and then you get the buttery, creamy from the brie, and it's a very good combination. Um, again, with cranberries, kind of the same thing as apple butter. You can mix them into so many things, make muffins, bars, cakes, mix them into frosting. You can just do a lot of stuff. Break it down, make it into a syrup too, so just lots of things you can do with apple butter and cranberry sauce. And then here I'll share these two, um, they're just recipes. Um, they're all evidence-based, so they're safe. Uh, most of them are from National Center of Home Food Preservation. Um, and one is from the ball site. 
Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk to you guys about our Master Food Preserver Program. Um, we are opening this up. We get new volunteers every year. So we're taking in applications now. So if you guys are interested, um, I can send you the link. Um, and so what this is, is you basically just help people learn how to do safe home food preservation recipes. So if you're really into canning yourself or you like dehydrating stuff or freezing stuff a lot, this is a really good opportunity to like share your knowledge. So what you do is you would just fill out an application and I would get back to you. And then um, if you're chosen to become a volunteer, you get to take our home food preservation course, which kind of gives you like the ups and downs of all food preservation. Um, then we have a day training, which will be in person for the first time since this program started. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then once you finish the training, you'll be an intern, um, which you need 40 hours of volunteer work, which seems very intimidating at first. But once you look at it, so like an example is say you're running an educational booth at a farmer's market. Farmer's market's from eight to 12. So there's four hours. Say you have two hours preparing for the market. Now you're up to six and say the farmer's market's 30 minutes away. You can add on an hour of your travel there and back. So you're already at seven hours for one event. So the hours definitely do add up way quicker than a lot of people think. And then once you finish that 40 hour one year intern phase, <coughs> um, the, all the following years, you just need 20 hours of volunteer work and then 10 hours of continuing ed. Um, and some things our volunteers do, they get the host workshops of canning, freezing, dehydrating, they teach people, um, they'll share their knowledge with them. Um, they can run educational booths, farmers markets. Um, a lot, it is very popular this year is a lot of people do judging at the county and state fairs for food preservation, since that's a very big project there. <laughs> and just quick, another thing one of our volunteers does she works with the Girl Scouts. So she'll do like dried leather fruit. Sorry, my throat. Um, and like refrigerator pickles. So it just does like a little more basic food preservation, but gets the young minds working like, wow, this is kind of cool. So that is all that stuff. And then here, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or call me. I know I kind of rambled on a lot. So just let me know if you need any of my resources or anything. Nadia, you successfully made me hungry. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, well, without further ado, Prairie, I think we're really looking forward to hearing the details of the 2023 Master Gardener training. Yeah, and there is um, often some crossover with uh, Master Gardeners and Master Food Preservers. There's often uh, interest in both areas. So yeah, thank you, Claudia. All right. Um, so I am Prairie and I'm going to talk to you about some Master Gardener updates, including the upcoming training. We're going to talk just to base at a basic level, what is a Master Gardener, in case you don't know, about our spring 2023 training and some highlights from 2022. It's our programming mission at SDSU Extension is to provide current research-based consumer horticulture information and education to the citizens of South Dakota through Master Gardener projects and services. So above all, a Master Gardener is a volunteer and individuals that sign up for the discounted Master Gardener course have agreed to serve as a volunteer. So it's more than just knowing about gardening, it's about um, being able to share that information in a meaningful way in your community. Um, so master gardeners have completed the course, passed the exam, and then they make a commitment to give back 40 hours and provide that research-based gardening information in their communities. In South Dakota, master gardener clubs drive a lot of the programming that that's done. We have 16 clubs, um, you can see there across the state and over 400 master gardeners. And what do master gardeners do? 
um, as Claudia mentioned, that farmer's market booth is pretty popular um, in many areas. People come with their gardening questions and they host educational events, um, plant sales, um, garden walks, all sorts of great stuff. Why become a master gardener? Uh, you're joining a community of like-minded people, uh, make friends, have fun. The Minnehaha Club went on a, um, they rented a bus and they went um, to look at, view some gardens in Minnesota. Um, it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> you also make a difference in your community. You're sharing that research-based information and helping people. And you also get to stay up to date on the most current horticultural information. So the process is here, kind of similar to what Claudia talked about in her program. You're first a trainee. That's when you're enrolled in the training. Then um, after you finish your training and pass that test, you become an intern and you begin working on that 40 hours of payback service. And yeah, don't be intimidated by that. It, it, um, it, it adds up quickly, just like she said. Then you become a certified master gardener. And once you've completed those 40 hours, your obligation is, is met, but we hope you will just continue as a master gardener. All right, so the training, I'm gonna share a little bit more about what you can expect from that. And, we only open that registration once a year. So if you wanna take the course, you wanna pay attention. Um, it's not open quite yet, but it's gonna open in December and we'll close in late February, early March. Send us, if you wanna get on an interest list, send us an email to that, that email address. And when it goes live, we'll email everyone and let them know. And we discussed the volunteer option. There is one other option. Um, if you just want to, the horticultural knowledge, but don't want to serve as a volunteer, um, you're allowed to take that course. Um, but we only bestow the title Master Gardener on, on our volunteers. We'll talk, um, so the format of the training is going to be mostly online. And you'll be committing to March, June timeframe approximately 12 weeks. Um, there is a, there's about 50 hours of content. So there's a lot packed in there. There's gonna be online videos and reading assignments. And then you'll gather on Thursdays to go over the content in depth with our experts. Um, it is So it is best if you're comfortable using Zoom or have someone to help you because a lot of it will be online. And those sessions are Thursday evenings, one and a half hours, April to June. So again, if Thursday evenings are a no go for you, it, it probably won't work, unfortunately. But in a little more about in-person sessions, we're offering those in Hot Springs, Watertown, and Yankton. You don't need to live in those communities to participate. You just need to be able to get there for um, one day in March and one day in June. Uh, March will be about two hours, um, meet and greet, meeting some local master gardeners. Then in June, that's gonna be an all day session, learning in the field, um, tours and hands-on activities. And SDSU staff share our expertise with you so you can help us share that expertise out in your communities, in your towns. So uh, specific objectives are at the start of each chapter, but in broad terms, the course teaches the, the art and science of caring for plants. And all of the, these are common topics that, that it covers. And I can tell you the training's excellent. I took it in 2019 in Sturgis. And next, I'm just going to share a few 2022 highlights from our Master Gardener programs. You can learn a little bit more about what we do. 
Uh, things are rapidly changing in our world. So the education doesn't end after your master gardener course. And to remain a certified master gardener, you're required to get 10 hours of continuing education per year. In summer, we, we boosted our educational offerings to master gardeners. We partnered with NDSU Extension to offer a virtual conference and over 300 master gardeners from both states registered and attended. Uh, there's a variety of topics. One of my favorites was art in the garden. And we also did a spotlight where master gardeners from both states shared some innovative projects that they're working on. We also hosted a lunch and learn series. And if you missed that, it's available on YouTube and you can see some of the, some of the topics there. We also have a, a mass, uh, annual update every year. And it's a great source of information and you can get all, knock out all your 10 hours of continuing education in, in, the, in that weekend. It's usually held the third weekend in September. Master Gardener Clubs take turns offering it. And this year it was at McCrory Gardens hosted by the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. About 100 Master Gardeners were in attendance. Some highlights, we had tours from McCrory, tours at McCrory, excuse me, photo contests, silent auction, and our keynote speaker spoke about um, indigenous food sovereignty. Um, we also take some time at our annual update to honor those that serve in our program. And the Gold Star Award is a prestigious award that recognizes outstanding individuals that exemplify our mission. So congratulations to these 11 individuals from around the state that did, did great work this year. And combined, these, these folks have contributed 190 hours of service to their South Dakota communities. And these are just some photos from the mass, from the annual conference. Um, that top photo is members of the governance task force. They were awarded barn quilts in SDSU colors. Um, the lower, that's the mini ha ha club and the salsa box is from the silent auction. Just to kind of show you some of these, some photos from the event. Um, these are some Brookings area master gardeners. They were great hosts. This was from a tour at McCrory, Games in the Garden. And the uh, is Christine will recognize Brett there giving her presentation. Our next annual update will be in Spearfish. So we're looking forward to that. And these events are open to master gardeners and interns. And we often flip. Um, back and forth from East River to West River to try to accommodate everybody. I've listed some Master Gardener resources here. Check out our website. You can navigate it, navigate to it under the Garden and Yard tab there. And check out our Facebook page. Um, Master Gardener Clubs host a lot of spring events. Um, plant swaps, plant shares, all that. And we post that on the Facebook page. And also below is the email to get in touch about all things Master Gardener. This is my contact information. And if you have questions about the program, uh, please get in touch with me or Amy Ladonsky. And thank you so much. Well, thank you, Prairie. That was uh, that was great. And uh, for all the master gardeners watching this, I uh, I know September is going to be here before we know it. And uh, obviously, that's going to be a fun time to to have a next meeting. But I'm really looking forward to the training this year. I've uh, done this training for probably what thirty years now. Uh, and it's always a delight to meet the incoming master gardeners. And we always have, a few that just want to come that uh, 
done it before but just want to be updated so they usually sit in it as well it is a fun time and i and i know the hours seem like a lot or may sound like a lot goes by very quickly and uh, you really are as master gardeners are our outreach you're our extension literally that uh, none of us can touch as many communities and people as you can so we couldn't do our jobs without master gardeners so i i really appreciate all the time and effort they put in on it well uh christine was correct uh, tonight's been a quiet night uh you know it's uh we haven't had really any questions though maybe we covered our topics quite well <laughs> and that so uh, i think we'll probably close off now so uh for me john ball uh uh, extension forestry specialist i'm uh, wishing everybody a very happy holiday here and looking forward to seeing you folks on uh, valentine's day or that night at least uh, i haven't told the wife yet but i guess i might be a little late for our dinner and then christine i just want to say claudia i think i'm gonna go home and figure out how to make one of those wreaths the inclusion of peanuts has me thinking you know when you're done with your wreath you could set it outside and it could become food for wildlife too so i bet squirrels would love it yes <laughs> so um happy new year to everybody and um you know by golly, if you get a chance to come out to McCrory Gardens, again, you might be like me and you're waiting for that snow, but it's going to be absolutely beautiful. I know it already is. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody.